everyone. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, we are starting to record these events starting from now. So we kindly ask you to turn off your microphone and turn off your webcam if you do not wish to be recorded. Um, I will pass this to uh, Professor Roberto Toniatti to give some introductory remarks and then to Professor Ventura. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much and uh, good evening and welcome to all. I have to limit my word of introduction to fundamentally two remarks. The first is to welcome and praise Nausicaa Palazzo's research and in particular the book we are to deal with this afternoon. The book portrays a social phenomenon in transition, namely the perspective of new families and of new living understanding of what a family is. It therefore focuses on the space of collective self-determination and on the wide field of opportunities of individuals to entertain family-like bonds of mutual qualification for sharing their life. From self-determination of family-like bonds, the next stop of the phenomenon is social recognition and acceptance of such bonds, followed by yet another step, which is the legal recognition and acceptance of the bonds and the phenomenon itself. Now, all the three steps from individual through social and eventually to the legal step are explored by Nausicaa in Canada, in the United States and in Europe, a circumstance that by itself shows to what extent Nausicaa is in charge of the comparative method, which is an authentic, uh, an authentic asset of the book. Furthermore, by having to use the phrase family-like, I had to acknowledge following Nausicaa how deeply rooted the notion of family is, at least in Western culture. The second remark is a praise for the Faculty of Law of the University of Trento and for the Center of Religious Studies of the Bruno Kessler Foundation that have found the way to cooperate for supporting Nausicaa's research and eventually this first volume of hers. So all the best Nausicaa and I'm sure we'll have a very interesting and stimulating session. Well, my turn I suppose. Um, good, uh, good afternoon uh, or morning or evening depending on where you're based. Everyone that someone uh, for, for somebody, it's certainly a good morning, I guess. Um, well, this is a very special moment for the Centre. I have uh, the, the honour and pleasure to represent, uh, which is the Centre for Religious Studies at Fondazione Bruno Kessler. Roberto mentioned that I also uh, uh, like to acknowledge this partnership, which was made possible, uh, in fact, uh, through uh, Nausica Palazzo uh, herself and, and her uh, um, in a quest for a methodology and an and investigation which is so innovative, uh, including for us in, in, in religious studies. Now, I'm myself more of a legal expert, so my take on religious studies is already very close to what Nausicaa Palazzo has been doing in terms of methodology. But what I would like to say um, today is that uh, her work and in general and, 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 the, and the very book is so relevant for us in law and religion precisely uh, because of the very little it says in open terms about religion. I haven't even counted uh, <laughs> how many times in the book the word religion has been mentioned, but this is not, well, how, for how paradoxically it might sound, this is not a reason for a, a, a lack of relevance of the book for us, it's actually the other way around. Because all the book is actually a challenge for us in, in, in many different terms. I don't want to be too long, so I, I wouldn't uh, delve into the, the, the many uh, different possible chapters. But one is fundamental and religion can be located 
in terms of structure in many different places of this work. And, and uh, 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 starting from the uh, civil law recognition versus religious law recognition, which is not, again, uh, uh, um, handled in the book, but, it, but which is, of course, somehow underlined because for, for, for believers that's so relevant. And, and, and another very important opening of, of the book is on the fact that for in, in the perspective of non-conjugal families, non-traditional families, this book uh, paves the way for investigation in theory and in practice, which goes beyond traditional boundaries of, for instance, conservative versus progressive uh, believers. Uh, they can be, you know, they can find themselves in different places with different strategies. And, uh, uh, and, and this book helps understand if read from this perspective, how dynamic the religious picture can be uh, in this in this field. So I wouldn't uh, you 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 feel my temptation to <laughs> speak even more because it's 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 so uh, uh, it's so stimulating for us. But this is the you know my passion about the topic stemming from the research and the book is uh, the best I can do to uh, pay my witnessing to. Um, uh, the, the work and, and, and to say how happy I am of this opportunity to listen to you all uh, today. So, I know Zika, is it my turn now? Thank you. So, um, welcome everyone. We have guests, I think, placed scattered all over the globe. So, indeed, Everyone has a very specific time now. Um, I have the pleasure to coordinate this panel by very distinguished scholars that will provide their viewpoint, their um, appreciation, and perhaps also their critique about the work that Nausicaa Palazzo has published with Hart. Um, I'm a long-term friend and colleague of Nausicaa. We share, I think, the same passion for a comparative approach and a critical approach to family law. I was very much um, interested in, in finding the, the approach by Nausicaa in um, discussing how family law is evolving throughout uh, several jurisdictions. And the book does this by highlighting um, the, the, the perspective that Nausicaa Palazzo took. And this perspective is as very, as made clear in the title, uh, the perspective of investigation of non-conjugal families. Um, we will hear from the five discussants how Nausicaa has managed to use two approaches um, that have been described by the author in the first part of the book. The one approach that is relevant in her studies is queer theory. And we see an extensive use of queer, queer theory in um, criticizing how family law still today is so much related to, traditional, to the traditional marital family, which is based on a couple and which relies on a sexual component. But Nausicaa criticizes this, first of all, from a, a subjective viewpoint, focusing on polyamorous relationships as well, but also criticizes the reliance, the multi-secular, the long-standing reliance on the sexual component of, um, of a couple. And the second um, perspective that she takes and um, method in discussing and comparing uh, family law legislations in various jurisdictions is an approach that favors um, pluralism. Here she relies on critical pluralism in legal studies and um, it is through this approach that she understands how family law is indeed still reliant on assumptions that no longer face reality. 
It is a legal dissertation, it certainly is, but we see a wealth of data that has been collected. Uh, I really appreciated the statistical evidence that's been provided all along the book of how family changes, and therefore um, the hiatus between the law as we find it delivered to us from tradition, by tradition and how reality evolves. And this is certainly this, the red thread of the dissertation, of, the, of what was, was her dissertation at Trent University and then involved in this book. Um, the jurisdiction have been, should be mentioned. Um, once in the first part, the methodology is, clar is, is clarified and set out, she then moves to the analysis of the law, how it evolved in the United States, Canada and Europe. Europe being subdivided, so to say, in the two main Euro in the two European courts, the European Convention of Human Rights, which is the basis of the upon which the European Court of Human Rights decides, and on the other hand, and increasingly in the past years, the impact on family law by the European Court of Justice, who relies on a, on, on 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 various sources of law in in European Union fundamental principles, unwritten um, law, unwritten law print legal principles, but more, more recently since the year 2000 and especially since 2009, the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, <clears throat> which has an increasing impact on the outcome of um, cases involving people and families before the Court of Justice of the European Union. Um, I'd wish to leave room at the end for discussion, for question and answers. Uh, and before that, we um, hope to hear how this approach by Nausicaa contributes to all, uh, to a variety of studies in different fields. And therefore, I, move, I would move, despite maybe being a bit earlier than what was scheduled, um, I would give the floor to our first discussant, who is um, Katharina Bödeböcki. She's a um, scholar at Buterius Law School, full professor. She's very well known, I should say, to anyone dealing with comparative law, not just in Europe, but uh, worldwide. And I'm so happy to get her, um, her insights on Nausicaa's book. So I'd like to proceed and give the floor to Professor Bulebelki. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Alexander uh, Schuster. Thank you, Nausicaa Palazzo, for inviting me to contribute with some reflections um, from the European perspective. Uh, I've read the book with great interest since I have been doing research uh, on informal relationships um, since 2013, and I will report on what uh, I have published together uh, with others. First of all, I would like to uh, uh, express my compliments uh, for the huge task uh, to compare Europe and the United States and Canada. Uh, that is not an easy task, uh, despite uh, the fact that comparative family law is vibrant. Uh, we see little of this kind of overall comparisons at the uh, mezzo level, so to speak, between the two continents. Um, I think um, uh, Nausicaa is completely right when stating that uh, uh, um, an exercise, a very fruitful exercise, is to ask whether the legal systems under examination are comparable rather that whether family law per se is comparable. And uh, I think uh, in addition to that, what she's stating, uh, we have left the stage uh, since long, uh, the debate about whether or not family laws um, among different jurisdictions can or cannot be compared is not really relevant anymore today. We take a functional approach, uh, the comparison between different family law system is done uh, since more than 30 years now all the time. Um, 
But what is noticeable, what I just said, is that little cross-fertilization is taking place between the US and Europe, except, I think, regarding the legal recognition of same-sex couples. So uh, my focus, as I said, um, will be uh, on Europe. And the question is, um, how does the regulation for non-conjugal couples in Europe look like? Where do we stand and where do, do we go? And I focused uh, specifically on Chapter 5, the European Convention on Human Rights, and Chapter 6, the European Union. Um, well, the question is, is there a trend? And uh, Nausicaa uh, um, states that uh, notwithstanding an increasing recognition of informal cohabitation, there is no such thing as a common European trend concerning its regulation. And uh, this is uh, researched in the context of the European Convention on Human Rights. Uh, the higher the number of jurisdictions that recognize non-conjugal couples, the higher the likelihood uh, is that at some point the court, the European Court on Human Rights, will consider that these changes have morphed into a European consensus. This is a um, statement of uh, Nausicaa in her book. And I think uh, she is right, but... Uh, the question is, is there a European, and, uh, European trend? And as I just said, uh, she denies that uh, there is a trend visible. Well, actually with this book, uh, it's out of the question that non-conjugal rela relations are receiving much greater attention. And she rightly um, um, puts the non-conjugal relations in relation to what has happened to same-sex relationships. And uh, this analogy um, uh, induces us to think that in order for the court to consider family law as engaged, there should be an identifiable trend towards legal recognition. So um, the development regarding the regulation of uh, uh, same-sex couples not only in Europe, but all around the world, is very uh, important in um, well, determining where exactly we stand. Well, I would like to put some focus on two important contributions to the legal discourse. There was first a, an article published in 2016 about the reasons for regulating informal relationships. Uh, and in this article, uh, several European jurisdictions were compared. And the other important contribution I consider to be relevant is a publication of the Commission on European Family Law, which was published in 2019. Um, these are principles of European family law regarding property, maintenance and succession rights of couples in de facto unions. And there we reach uh, the issue of terminology. Uh, Nausicaa speaks of uh, non-conjugal uh, relationships. Others speak of uh, informal relationships, cohabitation. Um, this commission to which I belong, the Commission on European Family Law, we have chosen for the term de facto unions which uh, is a little, um, well, probably more, more modern than uh, cohabitation or non-conjugal um, relationships. Well, regarding the first um, important uh, contribution to the discourse, the uh, reasons or the, the European jurisdictions that have explicitly regulated informal relationships uh, there we have C Sweden in 1973, Hungary in 78, Croatia, Catalonia, Portugal, Scotland, Norway, Iceland, Finland. Finland was the last jurisdiction in 2011, uh, which uh, enacted uh, um, legislation regarding the legal recognition of uh, informal relationships. There are two main motives for not creating provisions on informal relations. On the one hand, the legislators 
want to protect marriage in its traditional form and refuses to create a marriage light uh, by regulating informal relationships. And this may be due to religious, social and political reasons. And on the other hand, imposing mandatory provisions on unmarried couples who are consciously chosen, who have consciously chosen not to marry, uh, can be seen as an infringement of their rights to self-determination. However, there are these uh, 10 jurisdictions, Europe, European jurisdictions, that have uh, enacted legislation in this um, area, and there are various reasons for doing that. Uh, first of all, the steady increase of informal relationships as a new social reality. Second, the financial protection of a vulnerable party. Third, the influence of the national constitution. Fourth, the recognition of same-sex couples. So here again, we see the analogy between the one and the other. And fifth, the protection of a common child. Well, and um, the second uh, contribution I mentioned to the discourse uh, is the publication of the uh, CFL principles on de facto unions in 2019. These principles function like model laws and uh, the aim is that uh, they are filling a gap in the vast majority of European jurisdictions where still to date no legislation exists. Um, it is considered to be a contribution to the further harmonization of family law and um, much has been written about the method of uh, this Commission on European Family Law, which is an academic initiative. Uh, it can be compared with what is currently going on in the United States regarding the um, um, Uniform Law Commission Unmarried Cohabitants Act uh, that is uh, under uh, in the drafting phase, and Naomi will probably talk about this. Well, um, these uh, important contributions, I think, show that much is going on in Europe and there is more to add. There is uh, the Scottish Law Commission, uh, which is currently uh, has drafted a, a, a proposal how to um, enlarge the uh, protection of uh, partners living in an in informal relationship. Uh, there are two initiatives in Germany uh, also um, well, asking for more legislation for informal relationships. They are of, uh, um, well, dated um, last year and this year. So um, in this context, uh, I think uh, the trend, the European trend is becoming visible that uh, we will have more legislation um, aiming at protecting the weaker party in these relationships and that uh, this, um, this trend is uh, probably more visible than uh, Nausicaa has uh, reported in her book. But uh, I would like to end uh, with an applause for the broad comparative perspective, for the exhaustive analysis of legal and other systems, uh, for the conciseness uh, of the presentation, for the eloquent style, and again, I would like to congratulate uh, Nausicaa uh, for uh, giving attention to uh, a topic which is topical, which is very important, and uh, with this book, uh, more attention will be given uh, to the topic um, under discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Böder Wilki, um, for, for your opinions of, on your remarks on Nausicaa Palazzo's book and also for dwelling upon the evolving landscape in Europe, because we see that we also have some unique approach <laughs> to family law in the old continent. And it was certainly worth um, highlighting what's going on, what's been going on for the past years. And now Nazika could grasp 
indeed a trend. Now we'll have in a discussion also uh, later on to see how this trend should really be interpreted and how to what extent it's been evolving, not evolving. That's what the point where you made a remark about um, the opinion expressed in the book by, by the author. So we might come back to that later on. Um, now I would uh, move on and ask our second distinguished guest, um, Professor Naomi Khan of the University of Virginia. She's a professor at the School of Law there. And she's also very much acquainted with, with uh, Nodika Palazzo's work. So we look forward to your remarks, to your view on the findings of, of Nausicaa. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm delighted and honored to be here. And I was privileged enough to hear Nausicaa speak a bit about other people's work and her own work just recently at Alan Society. Uh, international and comparative family law meeting. Um, as I'm just going to echo what everyone else has said and what I suspect everyone else will say, which is this is an incredibly, wonderfully rich project that brings together, I mean, I, 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 I can barely master, and I'm not even sure I've mastered U.S. law, and you've mastered U.S. and Canadian and EU law um, uh, in this book. So, so that's that's pretty wonderful in its own. And you've also, um, uh, you, you bring together not just the descriptive of what's going on in these different legal systems with respect to conjugal and non-conjugal unions, but you also bring in, uh, you, you approach all of these issues with, uh, uh, with your perspective, your, your, your intertwined perspectives of both of queer theory, as has been mentioned, and critical legal pluralism, as 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 others have mentioned. So what what I, I what I like about this book is how it embraces um, uh, the functional the functional approaches to families. It, it develops this this in your words interconnected web of critical reflections that all build on each other, rather than kind of trying to, to sort of hermetically seal various compartments within family law. So the book goes far beyond the descriptive account of how non-conjugal couples are dealt with by the law. And, and it does trace through quite nicely how conjugal and non-conjugal couples are dealt with by both statutory and ju judgment law, but it digs deeper to show the need for and opportunities and hopes for change. And I, I have to say, it is so wonderful to have a whole book on non-conjugal families that, that is literally, glo well, that, that, that's, that, that's, that's, that's comparative in perspective. Um, I, I, I'm particularly interested, and I'll just briefly uh, talk about three different things. Um, one is just what do we mean by family, which is something that you talk about in the book. The second is the role of the state. And the third is, as um, the previous speaker just, just mentioned, um, I'll just talk a little bit about what's going on in the United States with respect to, uh, uh, to statutory change and some of the challenges that we faced in that when it comes to non-conjugal families. Um, I'm, I'm particularly, I mean, I'm, I'm very interested. I, I, I've done a lot of work on marriage and non-marriage, and I'm currently working on an article titled Families of One, Singlehood in the Law. And so I'm really interested in these issues of just what we mean by family and whether family is actually the right terminology for the types of relationships that you're talking about. At points in the book, you talk about non-conjugal pairs. And, and also I, I did, I, I, I hope you'll talk more about why you did, I mean, you talk about it in the book, why you limited it to pairs. Um, uh, but, but you talk about, so, so, so the question is, what do we mean by family? Is it, when you talk about family functions, you mention interdependence and you mention parenting. And even those terms are potentially problematic 
just who is a parent. Um, there's a new, in, in the US, there's a uniform, new Uniform Parentage Act that extends parentage, for example, to de facto parents, to, to use a term. Um, uh, uh, but just w when can and when, sh what, what, what do we mean by parentage? And is uh, what, what do we mean by the interdependence? Uh, and wh what about plain old dependence without interdependence? What is it sort of, what, what do we mean by family functions? And do these non-conjugal, I'll, I'll call them pairs for now, do these non-conjugal relationships fall within this meaning of family? And should they fall within the meaning of family? Um, I, I, I think, I, I, uh, people disagree with me, I think it is possible to have a range of relationships without privileging marriage as kind of the, the aspirational goal of, uh, of all families. And I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm so, 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 so it, it, it's, it's, yeah, can, can we recognize a plurality of forms of relationships without necessarily using the term family? Um, I also had some, some questions about, about the role of this, the state um, you are critical of legal regulation for how it has enshrined the traditional family, um, uh, but but so, some of the solutions involve it, it, it involve additional legal regulation, and so it's certainly worth thinking a lot more about some of the downsides of regularizing these relationships and just what it would mean to do that. I would imagine, I know in, in the US and I think in Canada and, and probably in, in many European countries, it's possible to get many of the benefits. You, you won't get, in, in the US, you won't get state marriage benefits, but you'll get a whole series of other benefits just by opting into a series of designating someone else to exercise healthcare decision-making for you, writing a will so that you can leave property, entering into various, various arrangements. So what, what precisely is gained uh, uh, with more regulation? Um, uh, does the state in regulating relationships somehow somehow unify these relationships in a way that undercuts your entire goal of trying to recognize new families. Um, uh, and so that that's the, the related thought is what about the relationship between legal regulation and emotional relationships? Um, legal regulation might help solidify and recognize the ties between these, these pairs, um, but is, is yeah, yes, I, I think you think that is the role of the state, but but what is what is lost in in all of that? Um, and then I finally want to deal just a bit with what is going on in the United States with respect to these issues, as um, Professor Milwaukee just just mentioned. Um, the Uniform Law Commission has drafted a new Uniform Act. I'm the reporter, so I'm sort of the scribe. Um, uh, it's now called the Uniform Cohabitants Economic Remedies Act, which is going to be considered to go final, gosh, next month. Um, it doesn't create any special status for cohabitants, but allows cohabitants to exercise the same rights as other individuals with respect to contracting with each other and to bringing equitable claims. Um, uh, uh, along those lines, it very much fits in, and, and I love, I'm just, I'm holding the book here. You talk um, about kind of, in the general part, potential remedies to deal with, with these non-conjugal unions. And the first that you mentioned is ascription, sort of imposition, um, which is what the province of, of Alberta does uh, uh, on these couples of a series of rights that are essentially the equivalent of marriage. The second one you talk about is the contractual model. And I think the U.S. approach in USERA, the Uniform Cohabitants Economics Rights Act, falls very much within the contractual model, albeit in addition with a recognition of the right for unjust enrichment. 
Um, the third system that you suggest, the one that you ultimately recommend, of course, is the registration by design. Uh, uh, and then you go on to talk about some of, some of the hybrid models. Interestingly enough, very early on, we had an option very close to the Colorado Designated Beneficiaries Act, which you discuss in the book, um, uh, in the Uniform Act there was incredible opposition to including this kind of an opt-in system. And I was quite surprised by that. So we ultimately, although it was in there at the start as, as a potential provision, we, we took it out. And what's also interesting in the US context is relatively few people have registered for either the Colorado Designated Beneficiary Act or the Hawaii Reciprocal Beneficiaries Act, which, which is a, a somewhat comparable situation, very much unlike what's gone on in France with the PACs, which I, I, I know are different, but in terms of sort of opting into a non-marriage registration system, um, uh, very different experiences here. Now, I, of course, the PACs are designed for conjugal unions. Just the final note about um, the US context is the city of Cambridge, Massachusetts has just earlier this year enacted a new ordinance, which, and it's just, it's a domestic ordinance. So it only covers the city of Cambridge, Massachusetts um, not anywhere else in, even in Massachusetts, much less in the United States, but it allows for more than two people to enter into a domestic partnership. So it gets at this idea of a new family and, and the, the, the wording of, of the ordinance is, it could almost come from your book in terms of recognizing new families and relationships, but it, it nonetheless limits this domestic partnership, even though it can be formed by two or more people. Um, uh, it cannot, the, the people have to be in a relationship of mutual support, caring, and commitment and to intend to remain in such a relationship. And they cannot be related by blood closer than would bar marriage. So it's, it's not designed for, for siblings, although it could include friends. And so it's, it's coverage and scope will be somewhat interesting as we move forward. Um, it doesn't even require the domestic partners to reside together and it allows mar people married to other people to enter into these domestic partnerships. So um, an interesting potential quasi model for purposes of, of including more than two, again, something you, you, you don't advocate for, but, but also in, in terms of opting into a, um, a system like that. Uh, I, I, just to conclude, I love this project of, of looking at non-conjugal non pair, pairs, and I, I can't wait to read more and talk more about it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the feedback you provided to not just to Nozika, but to all of us. And um, thank you all already. I wish to thank already um, the, the speakers so far because they've kept within the time allocated to everyone. So we perfectly in time with our schedule, which is excellent. He is um, associate professor at the University of British Columbia at Peter Allard School of Law. And he also uh, writes extensively on family law. We've read about his work also in Nausicaa Palazzo's book. So we'll see how much your way of approaching family law and, and um, relationships within uh, the people of a family nature relates to the approach that Anozika Palato has taken in her discussion. And um, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm honored and excited uh, to be here and join you talking about this uh, wonderful book. Um, it is a very current and non-theoretical topic in Canada. And before I go to discuss this particular thing, I want to echo some of the things that uh, my other colleagues said um, and add some more about the contribution of this book. Uh, one thing that has been uh, said again and again, but I will emphasize again, is the richness of this book. I love how quickly you can read a quote from Loren, uh, uh, from Loren uh, uh, Bullrent, um, a brilliant Chicago queer theorist, 
uh, and move quickly into critical pluralism, normative and empirical grounds, um, as well as contextual and very nuanced uh, comparative analysis. What I really like the most and find the most useful as a family law scholar is the framing and the type of typologies that exist throughout the book. Um, I will mention just a few of them, but as someone who write and teach in these areas, I find it extremely useful. Uh, one thing I loved very much, I wonder if the others have it's, uh, caught the, the attention of the others, is the verbalized versus non-verbalized functions of family law. I think all of us teach those and, and write about those, but I haven't made this kind of um, uh, distinction before, as well as partial description versus full description. Um, having this kind of framing um, is in and of itself a contribution to something helpful that will be used by other scholars and um, uh, professors um, in the field. So um, I find it really great that the book is so replete with them. Um, in addition, the chapter about the different models of recognition is exceptional in my mind. I mean, someone who has written about this um, um, extensively, I find it uh, not only original, but really, really helpful to have this uh, uh, different, not, different um, way of uh, categorizing um, uh, the different models. So uh, congratulations about that. By the way, if you hear some uh, screams in the background, I do have a baby here at home, so I apologize for the background. Uh, noise. Um, she just came exactly as I started to speak, of course, she wasn't here the entire time before that. So um, moving forward, I want to talk about two particular issues that come out from the book um, and talk about the Canadian uh, prospect of um, the, how Canadian perspective or what uh, a Canadian perspective brings to it. The one thing is the limits of courts um, or um, why can't we see a legislative law reform? Uh, 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 Nausicaa's um, analysis is very sophisticated about this connection or synergies between uh, courts' decisions and law reform. Uh, she thinks that courts are the best probably to adjudicate uh, 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 cases of uh, non-conjugal or platonic uh, 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 um, couples or uh, members, uh, but she's also aware of the fact that there is this kind of connection between the legislature, the lawmaker, and the court cases, in the sense that a court case can make some kind of a declaration and then later catalyze, um, uh, uh, um, catalyze a law reform. Uh, one of the main problems with political change, she says, in the area is that there isn't a massive movement to change the law or to challenge the law in this area. So I would like to pause a few moments and to talk about the limits and the shortcomings of relying on courts in these areas. And I want to use a recent case in from Canada. I'm sure that Nausicaa heard about this case. And then she heard about this case, she probably called the publisher and said, give me the book back. I want to add this case because it's the perfect case, of course, to your book. Um, the case is quite extraordinary in its uh, facts. It's about a gay a Canadian citizen who is also a refugee. He's a, we got the refugee status because he's from a country that is not stated in the case which country, but it's a country that criminalizes sodomy. Um, and he started, um, he met with a high school female friend in a third country. They had one night sex. In the morning, he told her that he's gay and that, he's a, that he has um, HIV positive. Um, they have remained in touch and she became pregnant. And now he tries to admit, now they've stayed in touch, she became a full, full, I mean, well, I'm, as, you know, and he's becoming an online, very dedicated father, I would say, um, super committed, including financially. And at some point he tries to admit, uh, uh, admit them into Canada. Now to sponsor someone to Canada, what you need to prove that you live in conjugal relationships for one year. So rather than saying the truth is that I don't think that they're necessarily in conjugal relationship as necessarily as the way that now Zika put, uh, uh, puts, in the, uh, the, uh, 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 puts in the book, um, they say we do fall into the definition of conjugal relationships. And jurisprudence wise, they're absolutely right because in Canada, the definition of jurisprudence has been very expansive and has never included a sexual component. So they go to the uh, immigration officer, the immigration officer says, no way, an appeal, an appeal dismissed 
almost immediately, the court there says that the, the immigration court says um, a homosexual man and a heterosexual woman are unable to meet the sexual component of conjugal partnership. Then it goes to the federal court and, and, and the court rever reversed um, the decision. Um, it's saying that the fact of their different sexual orientation does not foreclose the possibility of establishing a committed relationship of some parents. This has been celebrated as a huge success for non-conjugal families, in particular um, to mixed orientation couples. I don't know how many of you already know it, but apparently there are big networks out there for what is called mixed orientation couples. The Straight Spouse Network is a Chicago-based organization that focuses exclusively on supporting the heterosexual partners in such relationship, estimates that there may be as, as many as two millions in the US of those of the mixed orientation couples. Um, other people, one commentator said about the case, it unexpectedly caused us to reevaluate our concept of families, love, and sexuality. So really praises and celebration all over. But I'm asking myself, is it really opening the door to other similar couples? And my answer is that I'm skeptic about it. Um, there has been a very unique circumstances in this case, right? Both parents, highly committed. The fact that they were both, that one of them was refugee, didn't allow them uh, uh, to go into a different, a different state and try to get married there. That's another aspect of that. Uh, so uh, um, would others who come next be able to enjoy the same thing? I'm not necessarily sure. So why am I saying that? I'm saying that because I think that shows a little bit of the weakness of relying on courts to make amends or progress in this particular area, because there is only so much that a court can make uh, um, in such area. Uh, furthermore, the case might even create some complacency within movements or different people uh, when they come and think about uh, uh, that this opportunity for mixed orientation couples really exists. Um, What's really interesting, and that's the biggest weakness of a court-based approach, is what, what this couple did is trying to challenge their, that they are, that they should be in, that they should enjoy, that they should fall within the, the definition of conjugal couples. So they're not claiming, like Nozika in her book, Beautiful Foods, all these different ways to try to really create its own different way but they're trying to fall within the definition and expand more and more the definition of what is conjugal. Uh, so, uh, 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 and, and so I, I invite Nausicaa perhaps to talk later uh, uh, of whether there is any chance that there will ever be a movement, fragmented, but one that might be led by LGBTQ2 plus um, individuals, by the elderly who have some interest in that, et cetera, et cetera. The second weakness of a court-based approach is over-inclusiveness. Um, having non-conjugal being, uh, a conjugal being expanded so much all the way to absurd to include too many things. And this is a phenomenal case that just happened a month ago uh, um, and really extraordinary. Nothing, the other one is nothing compared to that. So a woman named Han went to a, 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 a wants to be a Buddhist nun. She went to uh, 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 to a uh, New York monastery. There she met Ojin Trinity Dorej, His Holiness the Seventeenth Gaiweng Krampa, who is essentially the successor to the Dalai Lama, and he sexually assaulted her, and she became pregnant. Um, she left the place and he kept supporting her financially. They have met four times. They've only had non-consensual sex. Okay. They've only texted one another from this point forward. So there is no question that um, they haven't lived together in marriage like relationship. She decided just she claims spousal support from him. And when she files a lawsuit, she needs to qualify as a spouse, meaning that she lives in marriage-like relationships under the British Columbia law. The, 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 the Dalai Lama um, uh, uh, moves to dismiss and the court surprisingly doesn't dismiss the case on the spot, saying that despite the fact that they've only talked by text messages, never even did the video chat, 
um, um, had only non-consensual sex, uh, they might still qualify as spouses living in marriage-like relationships. So once again, I think we are seeing uh, 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 this case in which the non-conjugal platonic partners don't challenge the priority for conjugal couples, but rather try to fit in um, within. And courts don't do very well in ascertaining couples in these situations and, you know, and predictability is an issue and so forth. Um, so, uh, uh, um, so I, I think what I would, I think that the, the interesting, uh, um, the, no, Zika is very, very right when she predicts and evaluates that Canada is a receptive place for progressive family uh, policy and stands in the front of having recognition of non-conjugal partners. But I wonder what, what's the path to do it and whether a legislative one will be possible and will be better to encompass that. And I heard through the grave line that you might have a book on on its way that is actually about social movements and uh, religion that is going to talk about that. So I'm very curious to hear more from you about that. And, and thank you so much for the really fantastic uh, book. Very, very well. Thank you. Thank you for, for your comments on Nozika's book. And we now have roughly about 20 minutes for a Q&A session. So I think everyone's connected within the same chat. So you can now start uh, either, I think, um, writing your question, letting have your question through the chat. Um, but I don't see actually any obstacle if someone wants to take the floor, raise your hand. You'll be invited to speak out your question to, to know Zika. Um, let me just open the chat to be um, updated on what's going on within our chat. Um, I think we heard different perspectives. We, we, we got actually um, perspective from all jurisdiction, well, legal areas that um, you know, Zika uh, investigated in her book. So Europe, Canada and the United States. So I think the panel of our discussions was very well chosen. And um, I must, uh, I, I'd wish to, to uh, raise one, one question, just as we used to say always, to break the ice. Um, and that's the role of parentage. I think the book um, heavily relies and focuses on the horizontal dimension. Um, I think that's, that took really center stage in the analysis throughout the book. Um, clearly, parentage is, is, is dealt with. Um, but I wonder, and that would be my question to you know, Zika, if there could have been given, granted more room to how family law is evolving when it comes to parentage. Um, because eventually, you know, parentage is historic, historically, historically uh, relying in analogy to marriage on a status. We will call it civil status in, in old continental Europe, but nevertheless, we could approach it as a status also under common law. And in, as, as in a common law spouse system were de facto uh, spousal relationship then becomes equivalent to any formalized. We've seen this also when it comes to um, a child-parent relationship. Holding out the child as, as one's own is a criteria that we find in European law as well as in common law. So my question is, um, what would be your, if we were to pick your brains in regard to marriage, uh, sorry, parentage, um, how, how would we apply your approach and your findings to that specific dimension of family law? And I'm, I, in the meanwhile, that I ask maybe you now Zika to, to provide a call, to react to all the discussions, remarks, and maybe also take my question. I, I invite everyone to raise uh, a question, share a comment on the chat, or by raising their hands. Thank you. Now Zika. Okay, thank you everyone, first of all. Um, 
I'm on the one side really honored to, to see these names uh, in the crowd. And on the other side, I'm really terrified, I must admit, because it's people that I, that I cite and that I really think highly of including some people that I met throughout my way, throughout my journey as a doctoral student, um, uh, wandering around Europe, Canada, and the US. So um, thank you for your comments. I knew it that it would be a very frank and constructive conversation. So I, I'm glad that it turned out the way I was expecting it to be. Um, first comment, Katarina, thank you very much. Um, I'm glad that you are more optimistic when it comes to uh, spotting an emerging, emerging consensus in Europe regarding non-conjugal couples. I think your uh, question, your comment raises another question, which is to what extent are we able to carve out the category of non-conjugal couples within the larger category of informal or de facto relationship, as you rightly call them. Because I, I think one of the main struggles that I, that I encountered in my work was some kind of lack of interest on the one side. So what like we could call a lack of social mobilization of public debates around the issue. And on the other hand, a lack of self-awareness in a way, to the point that at some point in my book, I ask whether this is an academic fetish. Is it something that matters? Because we, it's really hard to, to talk to an unconjugal couple, to meet an unconjugal couple, to, to, find, uh, to find them. Uh, so I would love to hear what you think about that. Sorry for answering your question with a question, but I'd love to hear you on this point. Um, Naomi, Thank you. I, I would like to go fast because I really want to, to, to hear other people in the crowd. Um, Naomi, thank you also very much for, for um, your perspective from the US. Uh, you raised so many questions that I hope I can quickly go through each of them. So can we avoid the term family? Uh, we can, probably it's not strategically useful, I argue in my book, because family really conjures up something that we like, something that we cherish, something that is important. So if we want to change the legal landscape, we might want to conjure up these things, uh, as opposed to using more, let's say, neutral terms such as households or pairs, which I use as a synonym, but of course it's not, it's not entirely a synonym, I mean family. This is why, um, at least this is what I say in the first chapter. The sound sides of regularizing, I think you're completely right. This is a very important point that you raise. There is a danger for kind of unifying and undermining the whole <laughs> point of the book in, uh, in, in when if you regularize more non-normative families. But at the same point, uh, there are ways through which we can mitigate the risks associated with regulation, which is, uh, for instance, a case-by-case -case approach, I think some kind, by default, the kind of mitigates this risk because it's a person usually who goes to court because she wants to access a legal benefit. So she wants that regulation. We're not ascribing imposing regulation. And second, if we look at comprehensive regimes, such as registration regimes, there are some very interesting solutions out there, such as the one that Erez proposes, such as the one that Mariano Croce and Frederick Swainen proposed, where you really can craft re uh, registration schemes that mitigate, uh, to the, really, really diminish the problems associated with this kind of, um, let's say, only comprehensive uh, legal regimes that by default uh, unifies as opposed to facilitating different experiences. So I, I'm, I'm fairly optimistic regarding this point. Uh, and thank you for raising the point regarding the Uniform Act. I didn't know about this opposition regarding the introduction of a Colorado-like uh, reg regime. It's super interesting. I'm exploring this issue. I think the United States is really uh, a, a deserves a discussion per se when it comes to this 
registration schemes. This is something that I'm trying to study now. Uh, it seems like there are a lot of problems regarding the, the let's say, historical context around many of these laws, uh, such as Vermont, uh, such as um, a way to a much lesser extent, but it looks like they, they were like animated by a desire to prevent the recognition of same-sex marriage to some extent. So it looks like the it looks like couples did not register, like non-conjugal couples. This is definitely, I didn't study Hawaii, but definitely the case of Alberta. So in that case, non-conjugal couples completely disappeared. They didn't register. And I think that one of the reasons is that um, the scheme was not for them. The scheme was just to kind of prevent the recognition of, of same-sex couples or same-sex marriage or some kind of dilute the recognition of same-sex couple within this larger basket of relationships. So I think that the motives behind these laws really affect their utility. But if we look at Europe, the case of Belgium, for instance, demonstrates that there are non-conjugal couples registering in Belgium. Luckily, we also have disaggregated data since 2018. So we see that non-conjugal couples register in Europe. But it's uh, absolutely interesting to compare uh, North America and Europe also in this regard. Um, regarding your last point about polyamory, uh, there is another municipality that uh, Somerville also uh, introduced it. And I think <laughs> you're right, it's fascinating. Why, why not three? I'm completely ducking this question because I think it's very, very complicated. Uh, it really raises many points in terms of financial sustainability, in terms of uh, all these taboo which seem to surround the um, dyadic and non-dyadic relationship. But I think you're right that we, we will have to face that very soon. Uh, um, Erez, uh, also thank you very much. Always fascinating to hear your comments. I think you're right that legislative um, avenues might also might be more promising. I haven't thought about this specific shortcoming of courts that you raise, that they try to kind of shorten their experience within the conjugal couple. And that's another, that's an additional problem. So when we do have non-conjugal couples, they hide themselves. So in addition to the lack of social mobilization, the lack of maybe self-awareness in many cases because you know we are siblings we're not family why should we be recognized we owe to each other uh <laughs> obligations you know so it doesn't function as uh with let's say non unrelated people necessarily uh but i think you're right that they there is an additional hurdle, which is that of framing your relationship as if you were a conjugal couple because you might have a more sympathetic court. So you might want to strategically downplay, downplay the fact that you are a non-conjugal couple because that might not help. Uh, so thank you. Thank you for raising it. Uh, I still believe, though, that getting some precedent in courts might really kind of motivate legislators because legislators have no, I don't think they have much interest at present to recognize non-conjugal couples. They might be at best indifferent if they're, if the if that becomes an issue, but they are, have no interest at present to do that. So if we have some uh, some legal precedents that might, uh, might help. And on the last point raised by, um, uh, Alexander, I think you're right. And I think that also that the issue of parenting deserves a book of its own, which is why in the first chapter, I'm just saying, I'm just talking about horizontal relationships, because when it comes to children, if you have children in the, in the picture, it's going to change the role of the games. Just because it's, I feel like there are two op opposite normative forces when it comes to vertical relationship. And I feel like the state is more and more intrusive when there are children, as opposed to uh, when it comes to only pure, let's say, horizontal relationship, which, of course, um, limits significantly the scope of my book. I'm aware of that, but there was a conscious uh, decision. Uh, I leave it here. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm really, really thankful for your comments. Okay. Are there any other questions from Marks?
uh, that we wish to address to, to Nausicaa. Um, um, Katarina Brevet, do I see her waving yeah. hand? Oh, yes, okay. yes. Good. Uh, in the same way, like uh, uh, of uh, Matthias Reimann, um, <coughs> and the question that um, Dosika has posed, um, this symbolic recognition, symbolic meaning of these relationship, I think it is not that important, the symbolism. This important is when the relationship breaks up, and then rights and obligations should arise. Is there a right to maintenance? Is there a right to share property? Is there a right probably also if one of the partners uh, of the adults uh, um, um, or the, 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 um, um, the couple, if uh, he or she dies, is there an inheritance right? So when the relationship comes to an end, then it is an urgent issue to to deal with well the surviving partner um the separated partner who has invested a lot into the relationship um they have joined uh, killed uh, children and 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 so on so this and it's uh, well sociological uh, research also demonstrates this there is always a weaker partner partner um after such a termination and uh, nausicaa has uh, also informed us about um the fact that these unions um are seldom picked up uh, for qualitative and or quantitative research and if we then now take the uh, the comparison to same-sex relationship, it is indeed, um, um, or I agree that given the great variety of non-formalized relationship, the lobby groups like the LGBT uh, organizations have not yet been active or have even not been constituted. And um, this also explains why little has happened on the legislative in the uh, at the legislative uh, uh, field and uh, that all cases so far have been decided by courts and courts have treated the same cases differently and have um, um, well so there is no legal certainty for those who uh, live together for various reasons um, um, that they not formalize their relationship We also have a raised hand by Naomi Khan, so I think she wants also to add a few remarks. Go ahead. The mic. I know we're almost out of time, uh, but but I did on um, the, the 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 comprehensive nature of this product project, which of course is is limited in in the ways that Matthias uh, suggested um also shows the the difficulties of sort of of one size fits all and of generalities and of um talking about conjugal and non-conjugal relationships and the differing reasons that people enter into those and also the differing legal structures behind them for example the elder law bar in the US is not certain that it wants the ascriptive model, for example, but um, I, that might be very different. I, I was on a comparative law panel with someone from the UK, talked about the British system perhaps being different. And so it's it's this shows the wonderful similarities, but also the differences of trying to generalize about about what should happen in, in each of these countries. And yeah, so, so, so the book does just raises raises so many issues, so many wonderful issues. We'll still have a few a few minutes left. Um, so if there are questions, well, clearly, uh, let's now Zika have the last word. I think that's her privilege today. <laughs> um, I, I don't see currently more issues. Um, I also wanted to ask to know Zika, um, how would her views be on 
international jurisdictions or para jurisdictions. We have seen also family law issues going up through the Human Rights Committee and, and approaching family issues, you know, bereavement rights, um, even the notion of, of, of family ties and marriage. Uh, could have could this have been a further chapter in your analysis, or was it uh, indeed not included because of the choice of looking to a more regional level rather than global, worldwide uh, perspective, as is the international covenant on civil rights, for instance? This would be my questions. We luckily have a few minutes left, some extra time for uh, delving in to the last de details of our discussions. Um, if there's no one else, I would leave the floor to you know, Zika to have the last saying on all the comments that she, she could garner today. And, um, and then just close up, uh, I would close up just today's event and group launch. No, Zika. Yes. Any questions, many <laughs> suggestions yes. to you? I want to add a quick point regarding Matthias' reference to symbolism and symbolic recognition. I think it emerges pretty clearly that it's not an issue uh, in the case of the before the European Court of Human Rights burden regarding the two burden sisters that was decided in 2008, where there were these two sisters that lived together for 40 years and they didn't want to pay the succession tax. They, they wanted the same exemption of spouses uh, for. Um, for the succession tax on the house, let's say, where they were living. And they strategically played the card of symbolism, saying that we want to be recognized as sisters as, in the same way as civil partners and spouses. But it was clear from the complaint that they just didn't want to pay the tax because paying the tax would have meant that any of the two, the survivor, should sell the home. So it was really driven by financial consideration. And I think this point is also emerging from the research that I'm conducting regarding uh, registration schemes in a comparative perspective that are open to both same sex and opposite sex couples. And it looks like, for instance, uh, when it comes to PACs in France, that the couples that are entering this, these regimes are less and less interested about symbolism, otherwise they would get married. They just want to have some kind of administrative, resolve some administrative issues. And as Katrina was saying, they want some kind of protection if they break up. Things like that. So I don't think, I think symbolism when it comes to some kind of couples is not relevant. Uh, regarding Alexander's question, regarding the um, international dimension, I'm very, very skeptical about it. I uh, discussed with it in, in the panel of the LSA because there was a beautiful paper by Ruth Alperin Kadari, who's arguing about the emergence of a new field of international human rights family law based on her work in the CEDAW. Um, and I think that international avenues are not uh, proving very effective, especially because not, it's not their fault. They, they lack credible enforcement mechanisms. So mm, I only included the European Court of Human Rights because it has a some kind of credible enforcement mechanism. Oh, uh, sorry, I have to give the final remarks. <laughs> yes, you're right. I, I honestly don't know what to say. It's just, it's just uh, a very strange, wonderful, beautiful, exhausting experience to, to write a book. So receiving comments about something, someone, you know, something I've done in the past for five years is just amazing. And I am really deeply grateful to each and any of you for your feedback and comments. Thank you everyone for, for being with us and with me. Thanks. Thank you, Nozika. I think you've been very, very lucky to have met so many interesting people along your way. That's certainly part of, of the history of your book. Um, and you've been very lucky to have this distinguished and excellent guest discussing your book. And I was very pleased um, managing this, this panel. 
And we've seen Naomi Khan already advertising heavily <laughs> your book, you know, waving it before the webcam. And rightly done, rightly done. That's that's indeed a worth a, a book worth purchasing either on, on paper or as an ebook. Uh, and the and the publishing house got the, the made the right choice. I think that is a book that will be of interest to many, many scholars. Um, Tom, we've run out of time. It's now 7.35. Uh, unless, there, unless there are really questions and remarks that you want to, to, to raise at this very end, I would say thank you to all of you, those that spoke, those that listened. Um, thank, thanks, a special thank to um, Nausicaa for having the idea of this book and of this book launch as well. Um, Zika is a wonderful person. If anyone has further remarks, suggestions, um, congratulations, obviously, as well. I think uh, he or she can email Nozika, who's now enjoying a wonderful researching time in Israel. So she's continuing in her investigation of how the families, you know, um, become reality all in all corners of the world. So we await for the chapter in the next edition on Israeli family law, which is quite unique and quite interesting. So Nazika, start working on the next book or next edition and add a chapter on Israeli family law. We we'll really look forward to that. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, finally, to um, uh, the Bruno Kessler Foundation and the Center for Religious Studies, who hosted us and organized in the background, technically, this event. Thanks again, and Nausicaa, good luck for the next edition and the next book. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.